but welcome to the first trails, tails, and ales. And we're now on to the tails section. We've done the trails. Um, cider edition, I should point out, because as someone did point out, cider isn't an ale, which I've realised, obviously. But um, the name fitted quite well, so we thought we'd go with the name and work backwards. Um, so for those of you, hopefully that, well, hopefully you do all know, but for those of you that don't, welcome to Mark. Mark's going to be doing a little bit of talking to us today. Um, so what I thought we'd do is just do a bit of an introduction. For those of you that don't know Mark, um, what he's done, what he hasn't done, what he can do and so on. And then we'll go through a couple of his races and things that he's done and stuff that he can, that hopefully you guys can pick up from that and learn new lessons. And then at the end, we'll do questions and then when other people start coming in, we'll sort of break away and go home. You can stand around, ask some questions, whatever you want to do, have some more cider. Um, the plan was to do two little breaks, but I think things will start a bit late. We'll, we'll have a little break in between, um, just to get another drink and go to the toilet. Um, and then we'll try and crack on to try and get as much conversation in as we can, rather than standing at the bar. Yep. Um, right, so, who are you? I'm Mark. <laughs> so, um, yeah, go on, you, you, you explain a bit of that story. Hello. Well, we'll start at the end, because the end is always more exciting. And we've all been on the canal tonight. Mm. Are you? Sorry, I'm playing a little late. It's not working, though. There we go. So we'll start on a canal. We all enjoy the canal tonight, yeah. I presume. Yeah. And this is Little Venice, the bit of the canal down in London. The, the nice bit of the canal in London. There's a lot of bits that are a bit more salubrous, shall we say. And um, yeah, it's a beautiful bank holiday, and the hottest bank holiday in British history. So it's an ideal day for running a really long race. Good choice there. Um, it's Sunday afternoon, about seven o'clock, and there's a couple of drunk people. Well, everyone's out on the canal bank, to be honest. People pushing push chairs, walking with the dogs, etc. But there's a couple of drunk people out, absolutely smashed out their face on beer. And they've got a great game. They've realised there's a race going on. Every now and again, runners come past them, and they think it's hilarious to hold out a beer and offer them a beer as they come past. And obviously, runners are serious people, so everyone's just saying no and laughing it off and running past. And then a little bit later, another runner comes along and they hold out the beer again. And the runner looks at them and says, No, no, I'll take it. And they laugh and they keep holding it out. And I said, no, no, really, I will take it. And he kept holding it out. So I took his beer. <laughs> it was really good. And if you don't know, Desperado beer is tequila in as well. So it's got a nice extra hit that's not just beer. I've been running for 37 hours by that point. Most of it hot. I'm absolutely steaming with the heat. It's the nicest beer I've ever had. So I opened it, running on the canal pass with someone else's beer. And about that point, he decided to chase it after me. Which was all right, because I could just about keep away from him. But unfortunately, my mate Ewan, who had come out to buddy me, you're not allowed paces from a Grand Union, he couldn't quite keep away from him. So reluctantly, I did have to slow down and pass the beer back to the uh, steaming drunk. If anyone wants to know, drunk people can do about 10 minute mile when they really want to. <laughs> And that's me finishing, looking dead serious and not like I've spent 38 hours heavily drinking beer to try and get rid of the pain of running 145 miles. And if you ever do do it, it's more like 153, which doesn't sound a big difference until you get to 145 miles and you're still a long way from the end. And that eight and a snitch miles is painful. And that's me, me, Drew, having a important sports beverage there. That's a nice brew dog. And that's another point on route. When I say I drank most of the race, I wasn't joking. And this is partly why I drink and partly why I run. So here's my handsome younger self there. As a lot of us do, we go to university, we discover cheap pound of pint beer, and then we don't stop drinking for quite a long time. We get to early 30s and realise our kids aren't quite big enough anymore to hide our guts. And we think we might have to start doing something about it. So uh, unfortunately, I got quite large. And if you get quite large, you know it's a home exercise equipment at 100 kilograms, and that's its top rating. 
So beyond that, they're all saying to you, basically you're too fat to exercise. Which is, which is nice if you try not to be a big fat later. Oh, that's me drinking again. So I started cutting down to just one beer a day. Still didn't help. And it all happened, there's a brief synopsis about it, where it all happened with my mate Dave. Um, he said one day, do you want to go for a run? For some reason I said yes. And so we went for a little run. And I was really awful at it. You had all these stories like uh, Steve White, who goes for a run, suddenly decides he's a brilliant runner, runs for GB. That wasn't me. I was awful, but sort of for some reason just kept at it. I fell into this thing called Park Run, which a lot of people have spoken about tonight, which is a bit of a dangerous drug, kind of leads you on to further things. Should definitely come with a warning. How long ago was that? Uh, that was 2011. See, I've never been sporty in school, you know, last to be picked at everything, stereotypical, you know, not worth turning up to sports day person. And for some reason, started to run, as most new runners do, covering every inch of your body you can because you're embarrassed. And then most of them running at night because, again, who wants to see a big fat sweaty bloke running? Didn't join a sports club because running clubs are for runners, so why would I join? Because I'm not a runner, I'm just a big fat sweaty bloke. And that's the first 10k that unbelievably I finished. And obviously most people, a lot of people stopped there. I certainly thought I stopped there. When I signed up, I didn't even know how far 10k was. So when they say expected finish time, I was like, I don't know. How far is it? I think I put down about two and a half hours. So I did start quite near the back. <coughs> oh, and then I decided to do a half marathon, looking very serious, and wearing overly tight shorts. <coughs> And then I thought I'd do a marathon because the half hadn't quite broken it. You're about to break it or something? No, no, no. Oh, no, no, no. you can ask a really quick question. Um, so I did a marathon. If anyone doesn't know the highly esteemed Luton Marathon, not London, but Luton, it's where all the great runners go. And it, well, I didn't realise at the time, but marathons have a cut off. So I'd done a few halves, felt a bit cocky, so I'd have to go a marathon, only a bit further. Yeah, five hour cut off. And I did it in about 4.58, only because someone told me it was a five hour cut off. At what stage did they tell you? I was about uh, three miles from the end. I didn't even know what a cut off was. Just a guy I was running with went, oh, we're not going to make the cut off. I was like, oh, that's good, what's one of them? I don't want anything cut off. But yeah, so I finished. Pretty awful. I was young 30s at the time, so you feel quite full of yourself. And then you realise you're not when you're overtaken. By a bloke in his 80s, oh, me first chair, in his 80s, literally just cruised past me when I was so cramped good and I could barely walk. But he didn't just have his Superman outfit on, he had this vest on that said 100 marathons. And I thought, why would anyone run 100 marathons? But he just sauntered on past me. So I thought, oh, it must be possible. And even though this one, down near killed me, somewhere in the back of my head, it kind of, something lodged that I couldn't even admit to myself, never mind anyone else, for a good few months. And I thought, well, if I'm beaten by this eight-year-old annoying bloke, I'm going to get my own back, I'm going to do 100 marathons. So, uh, several years later, I got to doing about 20 marathons a year. So I went from the first marathon to about nine months to build up to. And then it got to the point I could knock sort of one or two out a month fairly relatively easily. Also did a quadrilla a few times, which some people in the room have heard of, which is four in four days. So that's quite a good way of knocking off the numbers. It does really become a numbers game when you start chasing the hundred. And it gives the people run directors like over here a good feedstock of keen runners, keen to get their numbers up. So yeah, that's me piling in the hundred marathon with my wife and kids who have supported me brilliantly throughout. Occasionally I do get the odd it's like semi-sarcastic comment from the wife about the amount of races that I might have entered. So balancing it with family and kids isn't always easy. And on the way of my wonderful 100 marathon journey, you kind of realise that actually marathons are quite simple. You run at a set pace, hopefully. I get that wrong most of the time, but ideally you run at a set pace. 
You take your gels, you take your water, and you finish. And unless you break your leg, get hit by a car, or coronavirus cancels a marathon, you get to the end. But I thought, oh, it's getting too easy now. Maybe I'll try a few, uh, go a bit further. Try a few ultras, because, you know, just a little bit further. And what you realise is that ultras are a lot more complicated. And the further you go, the more and more things you have to worry about. So you've gone from literally turn up, drink, eat, and stay on pace. Suddenly you're worrying about, is it going to get dark? Have I got my battery from my head torch? Like tonight, are we going to get lost and have to double back and try and find some barking dogs? Apparently the other group didn't get lost. You get obsessed with the colour of your own wee, which is a nice game to play when you live in nowhere. And particularly difficult if you're running through the night to try and work out whether you're dehydrated or not. You end up shining your head torch down the ground in a very odd manner to try and work out any medical help. You're obviously worrying about tripping over, which is something I do an awful lot. You're worrying about things like course profiles. This is uh, trying to Grand Canary with a couple of bumps along the way. Worrying about your food. You're pretty much guaranteed at one point you'll vomit mid-ultra. And if you're really lucky, other things will happen mid-ultra as well. Sometimes you'll find the bushes, sometimes you won't. And I was going to put a photo of my own feet on there after one of our recent races, but it was too graphic for everyone, so a more cleaner version there. And this is basically the fun of ultras. You get a bit carried away, and before you know it, it's three in the morning, you're somewhere on the mountainside in the Lake District, running with two blokes you didn't know to a couple of hours ago. Suddenly you swap complete life stories, and you're literally codependent on them to finish, and they're probably going to need counselling to ever say goodbye ever again. <laughs> it's really odd. <coughs> so that's me getting carried away with a few ultras. Start with Simple 50 milers, which the first time you go over a marathon distance is a line there. Just screw with your head. Here's an ultra here. And what's it like going over the marathon distance? Are you fine with it? Or did your legs just kind of... Your feet just went... No, what... Yeah. yeah what, what are you doing? No, Why are you going further? Yeah. Yeah. You get a medal for 26, why are you going further? <laughs> Pointless. <laughs> and so that's a few of the notable races. So, Trans Grand Canaria. Yeah. Coast to Coast is a really good race. We've got the uh, lovely Grand Union Canal there. What I like most about that one is it's a long way by train or car. It's quite not often that you do a, a race where you actually look back and go, bloody hell, that cost me about 150 quid by British Rail to get back to our start. So yeah, a few hundred miles, etc. And what I like about ultras, is when we all start running, most of us, particularly me, start off down here. You can't run and you're fucking useless. And then you look at sports and you see people who are quite awesome. You've got Usain Bolt, really quick on the short distance, Paul Radcliffe, Killian Jordan, and you think, I'm going to start running and I'm going to be amazing, just like them. Depending on what distance you're going for, you have varying planned directories. Planned directories, I'll get them again. So I'm going to use St. Bob, I'm going to call the Radcliffe, I'm going to kill you in that. And you set off with that in mind, really focused, and you do a few races, and then you realise there's the crushing reality that we're all bloody useless. And however hard we try, and however many careful trains we get, we'll all be somewhere in that bubble. But that's fine. Because this ultimately is a fraction of the percentage of the world. The fact you're even in that circle puts you well above the average person. You're out there, you're enjoying it, you're hopefully not breaking too many limbs. So you were just trying to enjoy it because after it's just a hobby. And if you can smile when you're running, then that's important. So there we go. And that's me. I forgot to do the t shirt thing. Oh, never mind. You can strip off now if you want. Oh, really? Yeah, I yeah, brilliant. Well, that's that's an introduction to Mark. What he, what he also didn't mention, and what you might have picked up on, but he's also in a book as well. So all the oh, no, he, he didn't no, just no. have the bus for his his own sort of strange, <laughs> uh, I don't know, strange take on things. Um, so your book is 
quite well yesterday, doesn't it? Run like that. It did, yeah. We got the uh, Money Awards Book of the Year in last year, which I was shocked about because it was up against proper books by proper runners. So I was quite surprised to win that. And, but your, so the, the book, I've, I've read most of it. I've not most read all of it. it, I've read most of it. It's just too good, just saving it. Well, yeah, exactly. You don't want to. Well, it's too boring. I don't know if he dies at the end. Um, uh, <laughs> spoiler, do we? No, no, spoilers, no spoilers. Um, uh, but it's it essentially documents your your sort of from zero to hero type journey, isn't it? From yeah. your doing nothing. To so there's, there's so much, so much mystique around running, which is basically the simplest sport out there. And you know, if you can walk, you can run to an extent. Even darts players probably have more skill and coordination than the average runner. But it, it just looks so intimidating from the outside. And it's, you think about it, really only recently, the last probably four or five years, that stuff like park runs actually got in a, a mainstream and people know about it. Prior to that, there was the general public and there's these weird people called runners and you couldn't cross that chasm in between because they were some different breed. And um, uh, again, so you alluded to it at the start, um, for those of you that, again, didn't quite make the link, so Mark did the Grand Union Canal Race. And for those of you that did the six mile, the six mile route tonight, you, you went on the Grand Union. For those of you that did the four mile with me, it's about 100 metres up the road over the way. And what, that smile 70-ish? Probably, maybe? I did reckon that, like that. that. It was quite traumatic. There's a bit, <laughs> bit of water and a bit of mud next to the side, I'm sure it stands yeah. out. Um, uh, and that's 145 miles, firm into London. And that is probably one of the harder races in Britain. It's certainly one of the, uh, the longest in one the stage longest. ones. You're not allowed to stop moving for more than 40 minutes. So you can't kick, you can't sleep, or well, you can, you know, a 40 minute kick, but I don't know if that actually benefits anyone. But So how, how do they track that? I suppose if you fall asleep at the side of the canal, you, you get away with it, but the aid yeah. stations, they strictly monitor you in and out. Is Partly because they're not very big, so they can't have people no, okay. uh, catching three hours kit. So it's not it's not set up to pitch up. There's no no. no it's, it's it's very no, old. It's, it's very low key. It's been around for a good few years. It's now gone to a ballot to get in, and it's it's yeah. It's just pure. So you couldn't come up with a simpler race. It's start in Birmingham at six a.m. and then turn towards London and keep going until you hit London. There's, so there are two turns. I think the whole way. So it, I mean. If you if you heard that and me hearing that, I mean I know a little bit about the race, but is it as simple as keep your water on your left and keep going? It, it's down. broadly though, we do have to cross quite a lot. The towpath does change sides, so where a lot of time it's easy because the towpath literally stops at the bridge. You can see it on the other side. Other times, if you don't cross, you can go four or five miles and find that the towpath just peters out in someone's field. And, and, you've the got a, the and the aid stations are off the canal, so you have to yeah, have go back. Up. But yeah, it's just, it's beautifully old to go. Even the finish line is the most understated finish line you'll ever see. It's by the public toilets on the side of the canal, and they've just got a big bit of plastic sheeting on the side where they write down everyone's finish times, and that's it. There's no like inflatable arch or any of that fact, but for some reason that simplicity makes it all the more important than sort of something like London where you've got the gantry and the bands and the crowds. And most people don't even know you're racing. So they are out walking the dog and see some sweaty bloke who's been on his feet for 30 odd hours, come past, being chased by a drunk, wonder what's going on. It is beautiful, simple. So that race to you, would you did it did it go well? I don't know if it Yeah, so I think well, I did it perfect, right? It was like I said it was bloody hot. It was a year London Marathon was hot and everyone cried about that. And it was about twenty two degrees. And I think we had thirty two degrees for that race, so I didn't have a lot of sympathy for people in London. The winds and drifts. But, um, so, so you said that took you 30... 38. I had a plan of 36 hours to the 145 miles, and it obviously ended up being a bit longer. And it, it just shows how kind of ultras play with you, that I got to about 143 miles, and so, oh, if I really, really go flat out for two miles, I can do 145 miles on 36 hours, and even though you've still got miles to go and you've been on your feet for over a day, Something just clicks in your head and you just put the foot down and just go flat out for two miles, overheating, feeling nauseous and like you're going to vomit, whipping past people that overtaken you before, to get to this arbitrary 145 miles just to prove to yourself that you could do it, and then stop and nearly vomit in the canal. It's just a weird way of doing it, but 
you realise the human body can just randomly come back with energy when it needs to. What, what's hammering along speed after 143 miles? I did the last two miles at eight minute miles, but oh. most of it was a lot slower. And that was a weird couple of miles again at the end because I thought, oh, I can just get the 38. And I just thought, if I run, I'll get it finished. And I want to get my lift home. So were you run walking? Yeah, were the, the, jogging the, the whole way? If you do something like uh, South Downs Way, because it's very undulating, you get natural breaks, a bit like the route tonight. So it forces you, whereas that's just flat the whole way. You get the odd, you know, camber over a bridge. So you do have to be quite disciplined and start putting walking breaks in. And then the course record is a fraction under 24 hours, which is relatively slow compared to some races to show that even they're putting some walking breaks in. Obviously it's a mile quicker than I managed. Did you, have you done the Thames Park hundred? Yeah, the training for 145 mile race is a bit challenging, because how do you train for that? Is there not a runner's world? No, you don't, you don't get the uh, 16 week, you know, Stupid, yeah. get your best 145 mile run as well program, unfortunately. So I had a really great idea that I would do the 10th past 100 as training because it's most flat along the side of water. But then I also thought, well, that's Saturday and Sunday, the bank holiday weekend. I could get another running on the Monday, so I did the Milton Keynes Marathon on the Monday, where I was also one of the official pacers. And that was a bit traumatic because. Yeah, the guy who was meant to give me a lift back dropped out, I think about mile 50, with suspected liver failure, because he had was it kidney, which is the one that goes if you don't drink enough. Kidneys. Kidneys. Kidney. Yeah. Suspected kidney failure. He was bad. Yeah. yeah. So about mile 50, I thought, not only am I sweating like a fat bastard running 100 miles, I haven't got a lift home anymore. <laughs> so I happen to be running along with this bloke, I'm just saying, God, I don't even know how I'm going to get home, but I've got to be pacing the old teams about 24 hours after I finish. And randomly I bumped into him again at mile 90, and he lived in Bedford, and he said, I was going to have a nice romantic breakfast with a wife, because we've got a hotel. He said, I've cancelled that. He said, she's going to meet us at the finish, she's going to drive us home. And I've never met the guy before. And I was like, bloody hell, I could have been murdered. Yeah. <laughs> Is that how the book finishes? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, spoilers. Um, uh, because, I mean, I, for those of you that don't know the Thames Park 100, it's 100 miles along the Thames Park, um, run by Centurion, and I know that that is their race with the biggest failure, the biggest dropout rate, yeah. because people turn up to a 100 miler, and they think, oh, it's from the canal park, it's flat, that'll be easy, and they just keep running, and they don't take those natural breaks, so, I mean, I've run the, on the North Downs and the South Downs, and you, I mean, if you're running those hills, then you're fine, you don't have to worry about anything. <laughs> um, like most people walk them, whereas if you're on a canal, you don't you don't think to stop it. You don't. You just like, oh, this is fine, this is easy, and then you get to no. mile thirty, and then bollocks or something. And you blow out your arms. Yeah. yeah. Um, so so do you do a minute walk run, or is it a partly kind of by like feel? And always make sure if you hit an aid station, don't hang around an aid station. Have a cup or a bag, whatever. Fill it with the food and just walk and eat. Because then you've got your water break, and then eight a mile further down the road when you decide you want to run again. But the so many people at aid station sit down, and the whole you know, beware the chair thing they always tell you, don't they? I've seen so many people just sat there, even really far on in the road, or sorry, early on where they've they've been sat in the chair for an hour, and it's like, yeah, it's like you could have probably been in the contention to win it if you got off the fat ass and run. Instead, they've just sat there moping around, going, oh, it's too hot, and oh, I can't move. <laughs> so when you so it might not be the best one to use as an example, but when you get to aid stations and things, what so what would be your uh, your top tips, I guess? Oh, I'm a big fan of beer, it. but not a lot of aid stations have beer. I have to say, it's slightly more select. So um, do you you say like, like gels for marathons and things? Yeah. Do you, do you like a proper food plan or do you ban the gels? In terms of drinking, tailwinds always on most of them. That's very good. And then Tailwind, you've seen that, they've been like Centurious, kind of a powdered one they mix up. In theory, it's got enough in it, you don't need food, but I think you'd be a bit bloated if you have nothing but that for 100 yeah. miles, but yeah, it's good stuff. And the other one is just that Coke, and then someone recommended 50-50 Coke and water, which tastes disgusting and sounds disgusting, but it does work, it hasn't got so much caffeine, so much sugar. Well, after hours of just drinking, say coke, whatever, that kind of, you can always feel the fur building up in your mouth and yeah. the sugar, it's just gross. So you're not, a, you're not like a pork pie fan or 
Oh, I'll leave it. Right. Yeah, Pete's <laughs> is good. Matt Donald's yeah. is good. The, um, oh, I didn't have a picture of that. Did a recent 24 hour event in Milton Keynes, which was just lapsed for 24 hours. And the wife met me at about 1 in the morning with the McDonald's because she'd been out for the night with her mate. And that was good. And then it, was, it happened to be Father's Day on a Sunday. So she met me again at nine o'clock with the kids. And the McDonald's breakfast. And that was good. So I apologise for that. I was sick after you've eaten. No, not at all. Mark, you are forgetting on that 24-hour race when we're leaving beers out for you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> while, while we're running the 24-hour race, he's believing beers out for you. Even the team's in his team. <laughs> <laughs> our team won. True. Who won the solo? Well, that was you, because you, you parked that record. Exactly. Yes, but yeah, I think the main thing with ultras is you go to aid station, mm. eat whatever takes your fancy. Because your body will know what it wants, and whether that's a massive bag of pineapple, or a slice of pizza, crisp, whatever, just shove it in your face. I should have said, after the, when you did the 100, and then you paced them up the fins, what did you pace? Uh, 515, fortunately, it was the slowest pace group. Did you, were you on pace? I was bang on. <laughs> I did well, I did really well, I went out for a little run before the marathon, and I did about 16 minute miles of running. And I said, oh Christ, I'm going to let everyone down, but I said, I've got to go, I can't tell them like the morning that I'm not going to do it. So I go along, you sit down, you put the pacing bib on, I sat down in the chair, had some to eat, etc., loads of food and stuff there. And I said, right, we're going to go to the pens now, get ready to uh, pace, and someone had to help me up out of the chair. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, did you get a t-shirt for the Grand Union Crown? Did you turn up for the t-shirt? I should have done. Yeah, have gone for the century. You do for century, don't you? get a t-shirt. Yeah. You should have been in the finisher's t-shirt. You have to be aware of the patient oh. so everyone knows who you are. But yeah, well, I did feel a little bit of a fraud stood in the, uh, the, the pen and people were coming out. Oh, you're pacing 5.15. You have to be confident and go, oh, yes. Yes, I'm pacing 5.15. <laughs> Well, you're thinking, God, I can barely walk. <laughs> but yeah, after a while, your legs loosen off, and it, it, it went really well. It was a hot day again, no one can do what it is. I lost quite a lot of people I was right, going to be pacing. Uh, around me, saw a mate at pub, so I started with pine on the way around, and that worked quite well. And I saw the uh, wife of another club mate and stole a beer off here yeah, as well. That worked quite well. So when you've, when you've done, so when you've done a few, like, long, long events, over 24 hour events, yeah. um, uh, it's quite common for hallucinations. Have you ever had hallucinations or anything like that? Well, for a long time I hadn't. I felt a bit like I was missing out. Everyone tells me these great things about hallucinations and I thought, I don't get any. It's not fair. I've also not pooped in the woods on the run, so I, I feel a bit like a fraud being an ultra runner, but I did a Lakeland 100 last year now. She went up and seen me 100 miles in the Lake District. And I, I've not been to the Lake District before, it's quite hilly. <laughs> yeah, I actually call it the Hill District, really. It's a bit, a bit bad trade descriptions there. Um, and God, it was so painful. But about oh, three, four in the morning, we were looking out at these unmanned dobbers. So then if you've done a, an ultra where you have a little chip on your wrist and you dob it in certain stations to prove you've been there, most have got people out, but one is unmanned out on this bleak, bleak hillside in the pissing rain. And I was with these guys, like I said, I was just randomly met, and now we're basically going to have to stay together forever and marry each other. Because we formed this weird symbiotic relationship. And everywhere I look, I could see this thing to dob in, but every time you get close to it, it's just a rock. And we just kept looking for it, and it was doing my fucking nutter. And then it started raining even more, and we were on this big pebble strewn bit, and all the little pebbles started to look like frogs. And I didn't want to stand the frogs, because it's just a bit icky. So not only was I hallucinating when I had to go, I couldn't walk anywhere because the floor was covered in frogs. And even though you know you're hallucinating, you can't put out your mind and you're just thinking, I'm absolutely fucked. <laughs> but we did eventually find it, dobbed in, and just about carried on. Well, that, that was the hardest race I've ever done. Absolutely mullered my feet. It was ridiculous. They always say an ultra run, two things to look after, your stomach and your feet. I made a good effort to eat the whole way through, but I just didn't look at my feet until about 60 miles in, and I took my socks off and I was nearly sick, it was disgusting. Just the whole like layers of skin are coming off, the socks somehow embedded into your foot. But then we got some more burgers, <laughs> and it was shocking. But yeah, you just have to kind of run on with it, and towards the end you're just trying to find a bit of your foot that you could try to walk or run on that wasn't agony. And it's the one time I've taken painkillers in a race because I thought, I know what hurts, it's everything from the ankle down. I just wanted to get about it for a little while. 
So on, you, on the long run, yeah. do you normally change your socks? Do you tell? Do you I normally, them? if your feet don't hurt and you're doing all right, don't touch yeah. them. But this one, they were a little bit sore and then they go beyond a little bit sore. And I thought, oh, I've got another pair of shoes at the halfway point. But it could it start absolutely pee it down. The spare pair of shoes I have would do me no good. So I just pulled off my soaking wet shoes, put clean socks on, put the shoe back on and just thought this is going to be agony. And it was. Good fun. The only good bit of LA was the last mile and a half or so was finally on tarmac, which after hours of doing this, you just think, well, I can either stumble or I can just run and it'd be actual agony for about 10 minutes, but at least I'd be finished. So you just hit the tarmac and you just, as fast as you can, flat out sprint to the end just before you vomit through pain. It's good, Ultra, you should all try one. <laughs> so do you do, do you have any like special I mean, feet prep now off the back of that, or you just, you know, I, I, up the last minute, The main on. thing is, attend to your feet as soon as you can. Have a lot of spare socks, keep them in a ziplock bag in your bag, and change them whenever you can. Have you had to do that since? I've not done anything quite horrific of that since. Right. But I am doing it again this year for some weird self-flagellation <laughs> reason. For the 100 again? Yeah, I didn't like it, so I'm going back. How, how long did that take? Roughly? Not. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've got you. Has anyone done the Lakelands country? I think it was about 36, which is, yeah, not much quicker than I did 145 miles on the Grand Union's comparison. But the nice thing, the bad thing about Lakeland, it starts at 6 pm on Friday. So you start in the daylight, obviously you run, it gets dark, depressing, put your head torch on. But then the sun comes up, you're like, ah, oh, it's Saturday, new morning, I feel great. So you keep running, and then gradually falling apart. And then at some point, Saturday, it gets dark again and you put your head torch back on again, which is when it hits you that you can run in for what basically feels like two days. You've still got 20 or 30 miles to go. You're somewhere on the side of a hillside. You still don't really know where you're going. And you just question really bad life choices. So you've done, so I mean, Grand Union, obviously, is like a, yeah, flat a day <laughs> but like to, So in terms of dealing with just general tiredness and things like that, do you, have you trained for that? Do you just, you know, put up with it on the event? How do you, how do you find the, the train, like running over 24 hours? I, I can recommend having kids as good practice for, you know, surviving on very little sleep. It's a very good practice. Yeah, I didn't have to run though. Like, I, I've got uh, small twins, and so it's, uh, life's a nightmare. Um, so, uh, <laughs> but I, 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 I didn't run 100 miles afterwards, so it's a little, to some extent you get into it and you get through it on a diet of caffeine and sheer bloody mindedness. And that's the most thing with ultras is unless you're unless you're at the front, you're not running, you're doing a combination of run walking to get through and it's just making that constant forward progress and trying not to get lost. Which is another fun thing with ultras when you realise you've gone a mile in the wrong direction and basically just want to lie down and cry because you've just added another mile back on. Um. Probably, probably a silly question given that you got lost doing six miles on here, but what's your navigation? That's really good, I got lost. <laughs> um, you should all really get the. So, um, uh, I have an app on my phone that essentially directs me like Google Maps. So I will run, and it will, and it will sort of say, in 20 yards, turn left, and then you turn left. So if you've got the GPX route and then you've got these apps, there's no reason to, to get lost. Um, say that. I probably should have said this. Say that. Like, didn't say say turn that. left over the field behind the bush. Yeah. Did you have the app? Did you have the thing on? Well, no, because because three of us were off, off, don't you? He, he didn't say turn left. He well, with the lag in the Lakeland. He just went over to the left. Yes. But yeah, in the Lakeland, my watch just randomly froze at some point. It wouldn't turn on, wouldn't turn off. It was just frozen on the screen. And that had all my navigation on it. See, see, they do give you a, a map book, but you know, who reads that these days? Uh, yeah. So I was with, a bit lost. With your ultras, did they hang little like, ribbons and stuff? When you're not on those ones, no. It's a shame they don't want to see them. Oh, yeah. yeah, good. good. <laughs> they do that on the ultras and the little ones. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. yeah. Just the mountain ones, ones, they don't. Ones. No, no. So, so Centurion stuff, if you are looking to an ultra, is all really well marked. So if you're doing 50 or 100, I would recommend going with them and you would really struggle to get lost on one of those unless you're absolutely incomplete. Yeah, no, I second that. Um, I've done a few Centurion ones and they are they are the the gold standard, I always say to people. 
Um, essentially, that's why I tried to copy the violence. Um, uh, so what was your, so we, um, a lot of people in the room, uh, sort of ultra runners, or looking to do ultras and longer distances. Um, so what was your, what was your first ultra? I don't know if you said that. What was uh, first the first one was kind of an accident. I signed up for a marathon that I didn't realise we were going away on the weekend for. Contact the race director and he said, oh, it's a bank holiday, so you can switch to 30 mile on the Monday. And I said, oh, I'll do that. We can't be much further. Bloody <laughs> isn't it? Every extra few miles are terrible, like I said. And then you get a bit carried away and think, well, maybe I'll try a 40. And then I fell into a bad group of uh, runners called the Redway Runners. And they, they full of bad ideas and think, oh, should we do a 50? So you start doing a 50 and you think, no, oh, it's not too bad. I mean, it's only twice the distance of a marathon. We can manage that. But then, particularly with Centurion, you look down the list and go, oh, there's a 100 mile version. Maybe we should try that as well. And that's, that's when you start <laughs> ramping up and start doing sort of 30 mile training runs on your own on a Sunday morning. And what, what's your, to appreciate it can change, but what's like your, your general marathon time, like a 3? Uh, normally under 3.30, yeah. Okay, so then, I mean that's even worse, isn't it? So you, you do a 3.30 marathon, and then you look at 50 miles, which is like twice as much, and you're like, well, what, 12 hours? How the hell can I? Yeah. I'll do it in like <laughs> 7 hours and 10 minutes, I'll be fine. Like, you know, just spend a bit longer, and then you realise that, you know, like, yeah, a lot more than twice as far. Yeah, when I do 100, I normally try and break it into kind of four sections and aim for sort of four hours, five hours, six hours, seven hours, which does seem like a massive drop off. So you try and get a little bit quicker if you can, but it's more don't go quicker than four hours for the first. Yeah. And then hold on a bit and say. Yeah, well, that's, um, uh, that tends to be people's mistake when they step up is, oh, I'll go a little bit less American pace. But you've got to go a lot less. Yeah, you should go um, more less than that. If you, it's better to be walking in the first 20 miles than at home <laughs> rather than sort of finishing sort of thing. Um, so I think what we'll do, if we if we have a little sort of five minute drink break, toilet break, burger break, and then we'll. Yeah. You've been properly training for London this year, haven't you? First yeah. marathon you've properly trained for. It might be in vain, we'll find out if it's cancelled, but yeah. Yeah, so I did sort of, well I didn't train as much as I should for the first marathon, I did Luton and really regret it. I trained a bit properly for the second and third, which ended up doing on the concurrent weekend to try and raise a bit more money because the chance got for London. And I've never really properly trained since. So after a lot of ultras and stuff, I was lucky enough to get a local competition to get a proper running coach and got a ballot stop for London and so oh, let's go for it. Let's train properly, like a proper runner for once. So yeah, this is the longest period I've had of not running marathons. I've not run one since December, which is quite painful for me, I have to say. But, so I'm training properly and doing this stuff called strength and conditioning. And then if heard that, I, I never used to worry about that and I never used to get injured and then last year I turned 40 and you all just sort of fall apart. Oh. It's shocking. It literally is. It's like someone flicked the switch. Is he giving up running with his mates? It's yeah. Well, and you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, last year because I was training for the late 100 in the trans Grand Canaria, put in loads of miles, it worked brilliantly. I did finish them but then just, I just fell apart after so I was actually going to properly try and and worry about stuff like diet and strength and conditioning and not getting a fat weight back. So are you, are you enjoying like having a, a plan to get trained to? It's really nice not to have to worry. 
is to hand over responsibility to someone else and you just get it sort of week by week, you just go, oh, I'm doing this on this side. And you're not, you're not having to, eh, look, your dog, it's um, And not having to kind of, uh, not being distracted by the writers, just know you've got these runs down. And sometimes they seem a lot shorter than what you used to if you're training for ultras, but you kind of, it always has permission to it when you've got a proper training plan, but it says four miles, so I'll do four miles. But without that, you probably go and you might do ten miles, but the point is that's a recovery day because you do 18 the day before or something. Yeah, that's it. I mean, um, uh, I, I have a coach as well, um, I, for no real reason, but it is nice to, it is nice to just do it told rather than thinking, oh well, I could probably do more. Um, it is nice to sort of, like I say, you just wake up and it's like, right, Wednesday, I'm doing this. Well, I have these weird things now called rest days, which I don't know if people have heard of them, but I never really used to have them before. I never intentionally kind of run street, but I would run pretty much every day. And yeah, now every Friday I don't run, which is quite odd. So, I mean, assuming, <laughs> well, I say assuming London's going ahead, I don't think it will do, but assuming London goes ahead, do you, do you reckon you'll be on like PB territory or just good fun territory? Like, I'd, I'd like to be PB, but I, with the injury out of the back of last year, it really took a lot out of me. I kind of went to the point of knocking out kind of no well, anything over about three twenty was a bit of a disappointment for Marathon. And the last year in November I was kind of struggling to break four, which really brings it back to you that Christ I am actually quite buggered. <laughs> um, so so you've got London end of April, when's late? Uh, end of July or mid July, something okay. like that. I'm trying not to pretend that I'm doing it. Just, yeah. you know, but then, yeah, yeah. if you've got good, if you've got good marathon training in the legs, then yeah, you know, it'll, it'll lead be on. Right. And I'll be in New York in November, so I'm hoping to be. I'm hoping that one's not cancelled. Whatever happens to coronavirus, I'm hoping by November we've got on it. Yeah, we're, we're, still, New York. we're still worried by November. Then. If we still stop, that's the uh, Grand Union Canal. That's literally just finished. Bit of plastic with some names written on. But after that long, it's quite special. Um, so, um, so that's your plans for this year. We've, we've said that you've got your, your book. Any any plans for a, a I don't know, one like funny, that? Funny, funny you should ask. Yeah. I am writing the second book at the minute. It's about three quarters of the way through. Doesn't really have a title yet. It could be something like Ultra Duck or something. Trying to encourage people from better or worse try and run ultras. And again, kind of take away the whole kind of mysticism about it. It isn't anything fancy or clever. It's just running a lot further and trying not to shit yourself. <laughs> or knowing what to do when you do shit. Or knowing what to do when you do. Or you can always carry weapons. Always carry, yeah, the shit kit. Or, one of my friends did an ultra. He carried he, kitchen Yeah, he did. He, he went to get the wet wipes. He accidentally picked up a bleach wipe. Oh. So apparently he was very clean after. And very hygienic. But he, yeah. Smarty found that he brought the wrong wipes when he screamed ouch from a bush. <laughs> At the time he did that, I was actually 20k in front of him, but he was running with another friend. And... Oh! Oh, oh, yeah. right here. oh, you missed all the best photos of Nate in that last one. Or not? Do you take emoji or anything like that? Well, I, honestly, I've never had an issue with that. It's really like other people take emoji for part, though. It's, 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 there we go, oh, we've got some, there we go. I'll just it's play hard to be my uh, very boring blog, it's runlikethat.co.uk and uh, Twitter, I'm most active on which for some odd reason is Monty the Mark. Excellent. No but, reason, but, uh, yeah. Thanks very much and thank you to the Cidery as well for hosting us. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you very much. Cheers guys, thank you. <laughs>